it is time. I have finally finished my Virginia Woolf biography and I look like it, but it's time. It's finally time to start my second George Eliot. Finally, 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 finally. I am so looking forward to this. I don't feel like annotating, so I might not do that. I do feel like popping on the audiobook, listening along, finally starting my second George Eliot. If you don't know, if you're new here, I loved Middlemarch, one of my favorite books of 2021, so high hopes for this one. Hi, it's Sunday evening. I just uploaded the last vlog, but I've already started reading him on the floss today. I've been reading about a hundred pages. I, do, I just did some laundry and listened to the audiobook, which the audiobook is great. I want to tell you who narrated the audiobook because I always forget that. The audiobook is narrated by Laura Patton, Patton I think. She is doing a really, really good job. So I would absolutely recommend it if you're going to read this book, look for the audiobook that she narrates, which is published by Noxel's Audiobooks, I think. I always need to really look with the classics to make sure that it's unabridged because very often it's an abridged version. This book is already really funny. We follow Maggie who has a brother Tom and she lives with her two parents. Their father, uh, I think they live on a mill of course which makes sense because the mill on the floss. I have read 93 pages and why am I not sure about this? Maggie is a great character. I think you can kind of compare her with um, Anne Shirley. That is kind of the feels that she gives me but I think she's even more rebellious and she's even more of a fierce spirit than Anne is but that is I think because she grows up in a safe environment where she can just be her and where she's loved, especially by her father. She has a great relationship with her father, not so much with her mother. The character of her mother is very much a Mrs. Bennet effect from Pride and Prejudice. So she is really focused on the more traditional role of women. It's often said that Maggie is not that pretty or good looking, but that she's very brainy. And she reads a lot, which women shouldn't do, is what her mother says, but her father kind of allows her to do it. And she just reads a lot. And also she kind of reads books that a girl her age maybe shouldn't be reading but her dad just bought the books because he thought they were bound really nice so that's <laughs> that was a really funny part and then suddenly when Maggie is kind of done with her mother she decides to in a rebellious act cut off all of her hair or like cut it very short because her mother's always complaining about her hair and I think that was the point when I made the Anne reference when Anne gets rebellious she dyes her hair so she is constantly mirrored with her brother and that is really something that the narrator does she is really mirrored with the fact that her father wants to send her brother to school but her brother is not the brainy type. Her brother is very hands-on. Character-wise, she would benefit way more from an education than her brother would because her brother doesn't even want the education. He just wants to work with his father's business. And Maggie, of course, can do neither. They have a lot of similar behaviors, Tom and Maggie. Tom is forgiven for all of those behaviors even when it's like things like getting dirty or making a mistake or just things that children do. Tom is forgiven for everything and he is also very forgiving towards himself because he's a boy. He says things like that as well, like I'm a boy, I can do this. Maggie isn't forgiven for it at all. Her mother gets cross with her and she has a hard time forgiving herself as well. And after she cuts her hair, she says, uh, makes this very clearly a feminist novel right away. She didn't want her hair to look pretty. That was out of the question. She only wanted people to think her a clever little girl. It does have all the more problematic elements that most Victorian novels do. So yeah, that's definitely present in here. But I think from a feminist perspective, this is going to be a really interesting novel. And I'm also really enjoying the writing. In an historical setting, I always love to read most about ordinary people. I am not a big fan of kings and queens and royals. I always just like to read about what ordinary people's life would look like so basically what my life would look like if I would live 
a long time ago. So historical fiction and classics I always loved it and I think George Eliot also in Middlemarch she did a little bit of both but here she really is portraying the working class which I'm really enjoying. That is my update for now and I'll chat to you later. <laughs> Hi, good morning. I have been doing some freelance work or this very day I am starting to do my very first bit of freelance work, meaning I got myself a big cup of coffee and it's been such a long time, I think since 2018, when I had to drop out of college due to health issues, which I'm sure you know my health issues. I had to drop out of college and I haven't been able to work or do anything like that since. So this is a really big deal for me. This is just me starting my first freelance day. I'm really guarding my energy by setting some alarms that I take enough breaks. And I also went on a little walk today and just trying to really guard my energy and still be able to do the work I wanna do. And I'm just really excited to be able to maybe do more often some minor freelance work because I really really enjoyed it during this day and it went really well. It's Wednesday, it's the next day. Yesterday I did some freelance work for the first time. It gave me a lot of positive energy, but it also took a lot of energy. So I slept until 12 this morning and I started the day with reading some of the Mill of the Floss. Book is downstairs because I have to do some other things on my computer today, but taking it very easy today. Plot wise, not a lot is happening in the Mill of the Floss, but it is really interesting how the characters are used. So I mentioned, I think, Maggie's brother Tom, and Tom is going to be educated and he is learning in Latin, which he is really not good at. And of course, for someone who wants to be a businessman, learning Latin is not useful at all, I think, even in those days. So Maggie comes to stay with him and the man that he's been taught by, and it turns out that Maggie is much better at Latin and learning Latin than he is. But of course, he's not willing to admit that. And later, a boy, I believe he's called Philip, who has a disability, a physical disability, joins them as well. Maggie's already back at home, but then Philip joins them, and Tom, again, really wants to prove his manliness, that he must be better at academics than both a girl and a boy who is disabled. And I think it really touches upon what we nowadays would call toxic masculinity. And Tom is becoming a character I have me having dislike and I think he is going to cause a lot of trouble for Maggie's development in her later years, which is just a prediction on how I think Elliot is writing his character and the relationship between the two because Maggie really loves him, but she really shouldn't because he treats her like absolute crap. But he treats her in a way that he is taught to treat her as well. And in a way that he is taught to treat the disabled boy as well. Uh, because both Maggie and Philip are much better at academics than Tom is. And the father who seems to have great intentions, Mr. Tulliver, he is the one who is causing all of this. If you would just look at his son and see his qualities, because he is quite robust, very able to do physical labor, if you would just see his son for who he is, then his son wouldn't be so resentful towards uh, both Philip, who he wouldn't meet, but, and his sister Maggie for being quite academically inclined. Everything would be more peaceful, so I think the whole putting expectations and labels on certain people because of what they are, what they look like, or their gender, or their ability, is causing a lot of problems, and I think it's going to cause a lot of problems in the rest of the novel, especially if both Tom and Maggie go into early early adolescents, which I think will happen because right now they're in their early teens. Yeah, I'm expecting a lot of drama, especially because the back says that this will be an epic story. And because of Philip, the disabled boy, there is quite a lot of ableist language in this book, which I don't think has a direct connection to the author being incredibly ableist. She uses the language of the time, but the storyline so far as I've read it, I'm on page 200, among page 200, the character of Philip isn't written in an ableist way. He doesn't seem to have an ableist storyline. And I think that is kind of with classics. It's kind of thinking of are they using the language of the time, which I think you cannot judge someone for. Of course, it's becoming really annoying when it's repeated a lot. Or is the storyline 
what is going on. Is the character's arc uh, ableist or sexist? That is kind of, I think, a distinction that you can make while reading classics, or at least a distinction I'm making. And I feel right now that both the sexist and ableist language is the language of the time and the storylines are used to work towards a more epic plot points, showing how all of these habits and expectations from people cause trouble. That is my prediction, but of course everything can still change. I am not even halfway through the book. So the rest of the day I'm going to take it really easy, probably read a little bit more and I'll chat to you a little bit later. So I'm going to pick up some coffee. We ordered a big latte, two big lattes, and we also ordered a pie. I think I can only pick it up in about 20 minutes, so I'm going to have a little wander around the city and uh, take you along. filming an update in the car in a parking lot because I'm a real vlogger. Okay, so I got two of these things because we have been buying a lot of this like wood type things for the living room. We have a TV cabinet that has this black knobs that don't really fit anymore. So I got this one when I was at H&M home because I had 10 minutes left before I could pick up my coffee and I saw that our H&M now has an H&M home. I got also two very pretty mint green candles which I always get a pair of candles if I see them in a pretty color. So a scent candle as well which is a warm citrus. If I'm being awkward it's because people are working by it but I'll show you a warm citrus candle which I haven't sniffed it yet, so let's sniff it. Oh, thank God, it's really nice. It's like citrus with whiffs on vanilla. Oh, it's really, really nice. Oh, thank God, okay. I did for the first time go to a secondhand clothes store because um, I just had never been there because they were either closed because of COVID or I just wasn't well enough. Usually I buy all of my clothes online. I'm trying to forward away a little bit uh, from fast fashion. So I was really glad to walk in there and see that they had a lot of things. They weren't that uh, clear about sizes and I am plus size. So it's always a bit difficult for me to know with secondhand clothing whether or not I can get it. But I got this jumper for five euros, which is so cool to me. I'll try and show you. So this was in my size, but I think it's quite a short one. It's that typical kind of jumper that I would wear over a more summer dress because I am a firm believer that any dress can be worn in summer and winter just with some leggings and a jumper like this that you can kind of crop up in your waist. I'm going to try this on this week and take a little selfie and I'll show you and hopefully it fits. So it's been going really well actually this week with me health wise. I'm so grateful and a little bit scared that it's something that will not... Uh, stick which is always this kind of fear that I have when I'm doing well and I'm afraid it won't stick and I'll overdo it and I'll just pay for it later but like with the freelance work this week I am feeling slightly overwhelmed and a bit stressed so I thought it's good to move and to be out there and to uh, be outside get fresh air and just ground myself a little bit more and for me going out especially shopping which sounds really weird but that's a way for me to ground myself so that's what i did today boy is getting some food at supermarket right now and then i think i'm going to try and chill the rest of the day but i notice when i'm doing good health wise it's quite difficult for me to do activities that i do when i don't have a choice so when i am not doing well health wise but i need to chill otherwise in the evening when i try to go to bed my body is in a lot of pain if i don't it is conflicting and it's also conflicting to talk about it in a complaining way like i'm doing so well health wise this sucks <laughs> it really doesn't suck but it, it it has its challenges i'll talk to you later about the mail on the floors which i'm just really looking forward to getting back into and to reading again i'm reading it quite fast which i'm so grateful for because i started it way too late um, and i'll check you later
No. I know, what are you doing on the fridge? It's Saturday evening and I just finished the mail on the floss. Overall, I really liked it. It's a four star for me. George Eliot's writing is amazing. It feels safe to say now that she is one of my favorite Victorian authors when it comes to writing. But also definitely characterization because Maggie Tulliver is such an interesting character. I also read uh, in the back of the book Walter Allen's Fault because in the last 100 pages George Eliot tries to wrap up the story and she tries to add some plot twist she tries to add some just exciting things that make the reader want to keep on reading and I think she kind of fails at that. I felt like the plot twists weren't true to Maggie's character because she does certain things that I just I didn't feel her reasoning and the ending is also very Victorian which is all I will say about that but then in the end when I read a bit about the book it says the resolution of the tragedy however is another matter and since the novel's initial publication has satisfied no one. Unfortunately I do kind of agree with that. I think the last 100 pages are possibly the weakest pages in the entire book. The writing was still good, just the turn of events and the way that the plot developed just didn't feel true to the characters and that felt a bit disappointing to me. If the ending had been to my liking, like in a way with Middlemarch because the ending of Middlemarch made me cry and this would definitely have been a five star. At some point there was a romance development that really surprised me and I really really loved and I think because of that I think the middle of the book is my favorite part. I read it a part of it during the reading sprints and I almost cried during those sprints but unfortunately you weren't able to see my tears. <laughs> so my favorite characters from this book are definitely Maggie and Philip. Philip is the disabled boy who goes to school with Tom who I talked about earlier in the vlog and I really liked his character and he's really important to to Maggie as well because he's her only intellectual equal. There's definitely a good amount of tragedy but because of the way the ending is wrapped up I just didn't feel it as heavily as for example I felt it in Middlemarch or in Tessa T. Durbervilles for that matter. This is definitely not Tessa T. Durbervilles. Would still really recommend it. I still really liked it. It's still really a solid four star and I flew through it. I read this the entirety of this book uh, both physically and with audio and I put my audiobook on 1.8 speed. Usually I do it on two times speed. These words take a little bit more to sunk in so I put it a little bit slower. That meant it was so much easier for me to read. Sometimes when I was kind of done with sitting down and reading I would listen to another chapter just through the audiobook and that really helped me to read these 600 pages in one week. That's it for this vlog. If you have a favorite of George Eliot's please let me know because I want to keep on reading more by George Eliot. This was my second one and I think I have both Daniel Ronda and Silas Marner which I want to read next. So either one of those too but if you have a favorite George Eliot besides Middlemarch because I feel like that's everyone's favorite George Eliot then please let me know and I hope that you have a lovely lovely evening and I hope to see you in another video.